So imagine that I want to, to measure the time that it takes for a little marble to fall from my hand. Here's me. Here's my hand. Here's my marble. And the marble just falls to the ground. And in my other hand, I have a timer. Yep, that's a timer. Now, I do this measurement, and one time I'm going to get, let's just say that it takes 0 0.54 seconds. Now, when I do this again, it is almost impossible that I will get 0 0.54 seconds. And if you've ever done an experiment in physics, which you have, you will know that this is the case. Later, you might get 0 0.61, 0 0.7. All kinds of things could happen. Now, why does this happen? Well, in this case, it's clearly because there's a certain random element to when I press the button and when I let the marble go. And this random element ends up communicated into my number, which means that at the end I have a certain spread of values. That, and it's really, really hard to predict which value I'm going to get every time that I do this. Um, so in this case, this weird spread of values, this randomness comes from really me. I, as a human, I'm introducing this randomness into the system. Now, some people call this human error. I don't like this. I don't like this name at all. I think that there's no such thing as human error. Normally, when people speak about human error, what they mean is that you have a certain system to measure things that involves you, and that introduces a certain randomness. Um, I think it's much better to just discuss your method of measuring things than just simply grouping it all into, into, in, in this very vague denominator called human error. So it's much better to say my measuring system was not very accurate. It's much better to say uh, I should find a better way to you know, trigger the release of my marble than to say, oh, human error as if this, this unavoidable thing that whenever humans are involved, there's error. Well, that's not true. Um, you could have a certain experimental setup where humans, even though they're involved, they cause no error at all. Now, um, here, I am the cause of my uncertainty, but there's cases in which I am not the case of my uncertainty at all. So, for example, I could have a fully mechanized um, system where I'm releasing a ball from a certain height like this, like in a, in a little ramp. And, you know, I press this button here from remoteness, then this releases the ball, and then here I have a couple of photo gates, and the photo gates measure the time that it takes for this guy to go from here to here. Now the photo gates are fully automated system, so basically whenever this thing crosses, this will automatically record this. Whenever this thing crosses there, then the other photo gate will record this, then they will subtract the time, and then you will know how long it took the ball to go through. So if we do this thing, and we f measure the time, and let's just say that it takes this guy 1.35 seconds to cross. What happens is that when I do this again, I am still not going to get 1.35 seconds. Maybe the spread won't be as big. Maybe I'm going to get 1.37. Or maybe I'll get 1.41. It will certainly be a lot smaller spread than when you had, you know, your your timer in your hand because you were introducing a lot of randomness into your measurement. But it will still not be a very consistent set of results. And the reason for this is that you've eliminated some randomness from your experiment, which was in you know the randomness associated with you pressing the timer but not all randomness from your experiment because the world is made of billions of billions of molecules, the air, the, there are lots of microscopic uh, faults in the, in the floor that you can't control. There, even the, the ball is not perfectly even. It's, it's, it's not a perfectly flat marble, but there's lots of imperfections in the marble. So all these things cause tiny effects that end up affecting your results here. And there is no way to control these things. 
There is some randomness associated with every experiment you do, and there is just no way to remove it. You can try to minimize it by selecting a very good method, but you cannot remove this randomness. When we have this sort of randomness, what we will normally do is then, in order to get a feel for what the good quantity is, so is, is it really 135, 137, which, which number should I trust? Well, what you do is you do the experiment many times. And if you do the experiment many times, you start getting a sense for where the real value should be. So, so you do the experiment, let's just say, seven times. And actually, in, in real life, you do the experiment hundreds or thousands or even millions of times. But, you know, IB physics, we're not in the LHC, so we will do it five to seven times every time. And you get a spread of values. So imagine that you get 1.34, 1.32, uh, 1.40, 1.31, 1.35, and so on. And then you have this spread of values, and then you ask yourself, well, which one's the good one? And you don't know which one's the good one. But what you can do is like, well, I would like to try to be as far from possible from a mistake. So, so you choose the middle point, simply because the middle point is not the most likely to be right, simply is as far as you can from any of those mistakes. So it's really the best estimate for what we've got. So basically what you do is you take all these quantities, take an average, and then whatever you get, you guess that your quantity should be somewhere around there. But then it's not the same if we have, imagine that these guys have an average, I don't know, I haven't calculated it, but let's just put the average at 1.34. Now, I can have another set of values that also has an average of 1.34, but it's completely different. For example, I could have 1.00, 3.53, 0.52, and so on. Now, in this case, these may also average 1.34, but the spread is much higher. So, of course, these ones are much more reliable than these ones, because these ones are a lot less spread out. So, I could be much more, much more reasonably sure that the values are somewhere around here, where in this case, well, I could know the average, but, you know, it could be really anywhere. So we need a way to quantify how spread out these values are. This way to quantify it is really a number, and we call this number random error or random uncertainty, depending on who you ask. Now, in the IB, there's many accepted ways of calculating random uncertainty, but I'll tell you the, the one that is always correct and it will continue to be correct when you go to college and is that we use the standard deviation so we take all these values here and we find the standard deviation now the idea of the standard deviation is that we look at what is the distance of each one of these guys to the average and we get a sort of average of the distances to the average the problem is that because the average is in the middle, well, if I subtract these two guys, I will get a negative number, whereas, whereas if I subtract this, these two guys, I will get a positive number. So in order to make everything positive, we just square everything. And then you're like, oh, well, but if I squared everything, then I'm not going to get a measure of the distance between these two guys. So then what you do is then you take the square root. So let me show you exactly the formula that you have. It is random error, which is really the standard deviation. It's just the square root of x1 minus the average plus x2 minus the average plus etc 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 and now we need to square each one of those and then you do this for as many measurements as, as you have but now of course this adds them all up but you want some sort of average so you need to divide by the number of measurements and I'm not really sure why but we divide not by n but by n minus 1 now, th there's a couple of very important things about this. First thing, you can see that the smaller this distance, so the smaller the distance between each individual point and the average, then the smaller the random error would be, which makes a lot of sense. But then you can also see that the more points that I have, the smaller the random error. So if I have a million points, all these things will end up dividing by a million. So, and this is a general result about random errors. One way to reduce random errors is to simply take a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of measurements. 
Why? Well, because then typically you're going to get a spread that will go like this, somewhere around a certain mean. And the more you have, the surer you are that this is the mean. That's why in physics we always take, tell you to take as many measurements as you possibly can. 5 is good, 7 is better, 25 is even better, and 2 million, you know, is great. And in the LHC, that's how we actually find out things. In the LHC, we do collisions with particles, and for every one possible collision, there, there are millions and millions of points of data. And even with millions of points of data, we, we don't call something a discovery and, until there's overwhelming evidence that that is a discovery.